Hey freaks, Brendan the Blind Guy here. Now, all you black vultures and daughters of darkness who say that Rock is dead, well, <laughs> I got news for you. Rock is back from the dead and long live Rock, amen. And yeah. much Rock fans, because what I got right here will give you one hell of a buzz that will make you scream until your skulls explode. And it, I tell you, it gives me one hell of a jolt of life to my heart of Novocaine. So do not disturb me right now as I give you the best, most vicious siblings in rock. <laughs> Sorry, Kings of Leon. It's not you. It's Hailstorm. How are you? Wow. All that sounded real painful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, um, but yeah, 13, awesome. 13 song titles in about 30 seconds. So no, well, done, well thought out. That was amazing. That's amazing. I love that so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, like, you guys have got heaps on, as always. Like, I did a bit of online stalking of you guys on your Facebook page and everything. And, you know, I like to stay up to date. So, apart from your relentless touring and always for um, your fifth studio album, Back from the Dead, which everyone, if you have not checked it out, just go away. Go away. But, <laughs> but it is absolutely incredible. So you were recently here in Australia, which um, I just absolutely lost my shit at the Sydney show, as you both know. It was and, great to see you. Yeah, you too, you too. Well, um, and so apart from the relentless touring, you got, um, which includes you guys going back to Europe and UK sometime soon, and um, features you on the lineup of um, Rock the Park, sharing the stage with uh, other bands, you know, like Cypress Hill, Billy Talon, Mumford & Sons, Volbeat, etc., etc. So, oh, and you're touring with um, Metal Heavyweight's Ghost. So that that's a hell mm -hmm. of a lot, even though that's that's only like shipping the surface of the iceberg there with what you guys have got on. So it kind of made me think that's a lot of time on the tour bus with just you bandmates and your touring crew. So... How do you both like pass the time individually? Like, I, I know Lizzie loves being an old sister and picking on you, RJ. Uh, <laughs> but like, favorite pastime. <laughs> so, like, what do you do? You pack like a Nintendo DS or a few books, or you know, what do you do to pass the time? And um, we we each have our individual projects. Um, RJ is always doing something on his computer. He's got some side projects and and multiple things that are he's got bouncing around and so do I so I guess a lot of the time in our downtime we're kind of catching up on homework <laughs> you know because because let you know like you said it you know just just even mentioning where we're going to be or how we're touring is is only one part of what we do there's a lot of different things that we have going on but um as far as like leisurely i mean every day off we we all walk around and we go and we eat some great food and um you know make fun of each other and <laughs> yep. and uh, laugh and laugh to the point of tears so for some reason um all four of us have not killed each other yet we talk about that quite a lot actually about how there's no real drama that we have in our band like as the four of us the drama is like everywhere else like we've had drama with like crew and we've had drama with like you know you know our professional people and all the all those guys but it's like with the four of us we've never really had that drama and i think it's just because we've been living two feet from each other for you know 20 years and then rj you know more than that so we we all have gotten quite used to each other yeah. No, exactly 20 years. Don't do the math. No. Now, I, uh, <laughs> notice that she, the key word was yet, she said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, you, you're exactly right. And I, I describe it like this. Um, you know, music is our outlet. It's our therapy. You know, it, it's how we stay balanced. and It's how we uh, live from day to day. But we've also made a career out of it. So it's it's uh it, it's always what we have to do like it, it's and but we we love it like we we've succeeded in life because that's what we get to do but even then you need a distraction away from that so oh yeah uh, like during the pandemic i bought an xbox i already had a uh a uh switch and all that and i was like oh then maybe i'll get into that but then i fell into 
just editing fragrance content for fun. And that's like <laughs> my escape from the regular world. So like in my leisure time, when I'm not doing music or writing songs or, or playing on stage with Hailstorm or with Chemical Fire or whatever, it's all, it's, uh, I'm like on my laptop, like, cause I get to like turn the world off and just kind of focus on some other silly passion that I have that I, I'm for some reason weirdly passionate about. So that's how I spend my downtime most of the time. <laughs> Okay. And and that's that's such a beautiful lesson too in in self care because it doesn't matter whether you uh, um, are into smells or you like painting or you like collecting um, it, you know McDonald's Happy Meal toys whatever it is that brings you joy and that helps you shut the world off every now and then is really healthy and really helpful because even though we always, we, we, us musicians, we get this like guilty thing that happens when we're not doing something for our band that we, that we feel like we need to work on it all the time. You know, I'm like, we're lucky yeah. enough to make this a career. So you have to work on stuff all the time, but then you get so burnt out on working on that, that you like your body almost like forces you to stop, you know? And so yeah. you have to create that balance of like constructive, nothing. <laughs> and, and also like, uh, uh, constructive, cr like, something where you can still exercise your creative muscle, but in Agreed. a different way where it, it kind of distracts you from how you usually do it, you know? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And, okay, so that kind of brings me to, so you, you, you guys are saying that there's like n no drama between you four. Pardon me. Pretty much. <laughs> no, no drama. We, we don't have the energy for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was saying to Lizzie before you came on, RJ, that um even with my lack of sight i can tell at your shows that you guys feed off each other so perfectly and so naturally it's like you're one unit feeding off each other you're just like a nuclear unit that just gets keeps getting brighter and brighter and it's like no matter what the world throws at you no matter what the crowd at each night throws at you you, you just take it and go, yeah, yeah, whatever. We're awesome. We've got this shit down pat. <laughs> how, like, how do you get to that point? Like, I remember when I was talking to Lizzie four years ago that, you know, she put it as, like, when you guys are doing solos on stage and everything, it's not rehearsed down to the note. It's kind of like controlled mayhem where you're just, like, you're listening to each other and really feeding off each other. So how did you guys get to that point where your bonds are just so tight and so down pat? Like, how did you get there? Um, well, we started practicing 14 hours a day in our parents' basement, so there's <laughs> that. Um, but, and, and spending a lot of time with each other and also discussing things. And one of the reasons that we started doing uh, you know, kind of the controlled mayhem, as you put it, and the and the the improv was because it's exciting, and because it's risky. There's there is such a thing as a band being too rehearsed to the point that it the set becomes boring. You know, like we've all seen those bands where like they do the same set every night, same set every night, same set every night, same moments, same speeches, same the same subject matter to talk about, and and we've done that before. And it gets really boring to the point where it just feels like we're calling it in or that we're reading it. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's it's special and in the moment. So as much of a risk as it is to throw ourselves out there with no safety net, um, that's still where we get our joy and our and that's where life happens. So and and may and may I add just with your unique perspective, how big of a compliment that is for us because you have that lack of sight so you're not being impressed by the light show or or rj's green hair which he doesn't have anymore but <laughs> you used to be able to you know even you could probably Shh. see him he was he was that was, he was so bright <laughs> <laughs> you were but, supposed to tell um, that <laughs> but, it's, but it's it's just such a beautiful thing your perspective of the show because you're able to hear almost the things that everybody around you is taking for granted. So you're very zeroed in on that. And I think that's wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much to me. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a real thing. You know, like you definitely have a really heightened uh, intuition of observing the world 
through through your other senses. And of course, when you're going out to see a band, the most important thing is the sound. It's the music. It's an audible art, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're right. It is really amazing that you were able to, to detect those things that other people probably don't pick up on, but you have the ability to really zero in on, on those yeah. certain elements. So it, yeah, like I could speak for Lizzie too, like at least from my experience, like doing interviews, like, I don't know if anyone's really put it quite that way. It's really impressive. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you. So I've, I've got to ask that, so like when you're on tour on a high and you're on the grind and everything, that's like, it's amazing. You're doing it, what, like nine, nine months a year or something, or probably more. So how do you guys, um, like when you go home and you get off the high of touring, like, because I know it's like, I don't know personally, but I've, I've heard from other artists and from watching documentary, documentaries and everything that it's a massive drop from cloud nine when you come home and you get off tour and you get back to reality and you're like, you don't know what to do with yourself a lot of the time. How do you guys go kind of coming back down to earth in your downtime and kind of fit, trying to fit back into reality and spending time with family? Like, how do you cope with that massive drop? <laughs> um I don't know we we call it the re-entry <laughs> it's like we're all astronauts and we're coming back into the earth's atmosphere and, um it's interesting because I, I I think for friends and 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 family that just kind of live you know a, well I guess a more normal life than we do um, it, it's hard. I think it's hard for both of us in with certain people to come back into somebody's life after we've been out on tour, because when you're out on tour, you, you naturally evolve. I, I always feel like I'm a different person after every tour. Like I'm not the same as when I went out. So it's almost like you have to reintroduce yourself to people. You know, it's like you have to get through the small talk first and they want to hear about the tour and everything. And then we get down to like the nitty gritty. Now, that being said, there are a handful of people in my life that we pick up right where we left off. And those are the people that kind of understand or have experience doing what we do. Um, but it depends because, I mean, all, you know, all of us have kind of different normal lives now, too. Whereas when we were growing up together and first starting to tour and, and, you know, all the way, you know, through our, um, you know, through our early thirties, we were all kind of living the same life. So the four of us have the same life when we're out on tour, but then when we get off, Josh has two kids now and a wife. So he's got his like separate world that he has to jump into. Um, you know, RJ has an awesome girl and a dog and um, he's jumping into that and he's got his other projects. And then for me, it's a little weird because I kind of am, I'm living, I'm trying to live the same life that I've been living on tour um, when I'm home. And so like, you're both parts really tired. And then you're also like, I got to do stuff. I got to do something. What are we doing tonight? Where's the mission? Because all of a sudden it gets around what what would be showtime, you know? <laughs> You're like, oh no, we would be going on on tour right now. I'm wide awake. I'm wired. You want to go out? Let's go out. <laughs> so I'll, um, I'll tell you what you do at home, cool. Lizzie. You cook. What? And Lizzie has become an incredible cook. That is true. I do cook. <laughs> that, good way to pass the time. You've been Thank killing you, it. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, that, that's true. Um, uh, in, in my case, uh, I need to have a partner that is that that can handle what I do for a living. It's tough. You're right. Like you're always on the. You're living a three ounce life. You're you're everything that you do is tailored towards travel, towards being in a different zip code every single day, and uh, that can be hard on a lot of people who choose to build a life with someone who does this for a living. Luckily, I have a girl who's completely independent in every sense of the word. And, um, and yeah, it, after a while you start to get really good at switching back and forth between touring mm -hmm. mode to home mode, uh, you know, rock star on stage, fucking, you know, sorry, thousands of fans, uh, you know, uh, uh, dog dad and boyfriend. It's like, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, like th that has made it a lot less stressful is, is finding someone that, that truly understands that, you know? 
I also think that we, you and I, RJ, just from growing up and doing this and being like both bandmates and siblings, I think that that helped train us both yeah. to like put on those different hats, you know, like, okay, it's like normal, not normal, normal you know, um, yeah. because, you know, R RJ and I have these beautiful conversations as bandmates and then we also have these separate conversations as just brother and sister and and we have a history you know together that's you know separate from the band too so yeah i feel like that was training ground for this this life it's all integrated together now family yeah, know, band that, music that, everything it's all, it's all big mess yeah. it's gotten <laughs> really no... blurry over the years yeah <laughs> Those are not hard lines anymore <laughs> you know <laughs> but that is something that makes touring life a lot more you know tolerable and a lot more fun is is that family dynamic not only between us immediate siblings but our bandmates our crew all the way down to our truck drivers you know like everyone we are a big family out here and we're all we're all on the same page oh that's awesome that, that's so cool now i I've, I've got to ask rj so i've been wanting to ask you for years but never seem to have the chance i've just got to know how like, how long did it take you to be okay with rocking out on stage to your sister singing about, like, <laughs> off on a peeping Tom, getting off on her, over it, you, know, uh, you know, the story of Do Not Disturb and everything, like, because... Yeah, well, you know, it's it's rock and roll, <laughs> and, uh, and they expect a certain type of lyrical subject matter out of us, and, uh, yeah, like, uh, that was, I was over it pretty much from the, the first album cycle. It's like, you know what? I mean, a lot of uh, pretty much every other rock band at the same time had a sex song, a stripper song, a this and that. There was something in your mouth by uh, Nickelback. It was porn star dancing by uh, My Darkest Days. It was Bad Bad Girlfriend by Theory of a Dead Man. Like everybody had their stripper song and we, you know, needed to get on the radio. We needed something that fit the bill and, uh, a song like I Get Off was originally about like how we, so to speak, like get so amped and jazzed about playing in front of an audience, but then uh, was kind of more like, now nah, we got to turn it into like, and you know, throughout, yeah. throughout the co-writes were like, okay, like we had writers that were, that we were working with and, um, and tailored everything to where it would be more fit on radio, more mass appeal and those kind of things. So that was kind of our handshake to the world. And, and then we just kind of, don't have a choice now. Like we're always going to have to have something like that, but you know, it's, it's art expression and, um, and it's songwriting and it's, and songwriting is sacred. And, uh, you know, um, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, if anything, like Lizzie and I have been best friends since the beginning and, and we're very open and honest about, about, you know, Everything. real things in life, you know, in fact, I, a little bear, I think, I think it was Lizzie that gave me the, the talk, uh, one, like when I was starting to date and starting to get interested in girls, she's like, Hey, just so you know, they have these things that will protect you. You should probably get some of those, you know? So, um, you know, it's, well, <laughs> yeah. uh, let me, let, let me, let me rescue you for a second. Cause I, cause you probably won't say this about yourself, but <laughs> I, uh, but I remember like after a little while, you know, especially with, I get off, like RJ said, like that started out as a different subject matter. And then kind of developed into this sexually charged thing, which was where I kind of found my, my power in, um, in being open and honest and expression, expressing sexuality um, for two reasons. One, I needed to, and number two, um, I figured if the boys can do it, so can I. And I, I, and I, I remember being on the bus with RJ cause you, cause RJ had a period of time where like, he was really like, just not having it. He's like, really red handprint on your ass again? Like, seriously, you're going to say this. And after, after a little while of him realizing that like, no, 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 like that's, that's something that is still a part of her and she wouldn't be doing this if she didn't want to do it. I remember you saying to me like, man, you know, like I, I'm your ally. I'll support you. Um, I'm your brother. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you wanted to go and write a song about sex, I would be your backing vocalist, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, so he's just been really supportive for you know, they, they all, said the all same... these years of me of doing that and, and, yeah. you know, 
answering these types of questions. <laughs> I mean, they, they said the same thing about Heart, like, you know, about the songs that, that they were mm -hmm. writing. And they said the same thing about Van Halen. And, you know, I mean, just look at any sibling band. It's, it's rock and roll, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's always going to be a, a want for, uh, for audience members to want to, hear things along those lines and it just fits the bill of being in a rock band so yeah. you know it's kind of unavoidable i guess and, when and it then, comes to and then everybody a rock will band, just you know? look for and then everybody will just look for an excuse yeah. like oh they're siblings oh that must be like gross and weird so yeah. anyway but but the, the, you know it's it's uh, I, I believe that human sexuality is just like any other sort of human psychology. There should not be any shame. There should not be, uh, it should be a very positive thing. And it should be something that people should be able to talk about, um, you know, because you're right, that, that is just not, that is just human behavior. And it's, it's nothing to, to be weirded out about. It's, you know, and, and also when it comes to a creative environment, like when it comes to songwriting, it's like, you know, I'll, bets are off you know it's you should be able to write what what you're truly passionate about and you know yeah. regardless that's an awesome view to have rj and, and and lizzie that's oh, really awesome okay and so i've got to ask which country was do not disturb based on lizzie like when you say i love your accent which <laughs> Um, uh, there, there are multiple countries. Which one would you, uh, would you favor <laughs> for your answer? But I'm, I'm just like, oh. Australia, of course. <laughs> but, uh, our accent isn't that good and it's not that sexy, love. I don't know. I, I think disagree. the Australian accent is one of the best accents of all time. <laughs> Oh yeah, Irish for me. It's, it's Irish. I, oh, Irish too. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yep, yep. And um, <laughs> well, so, okay, so you. New Zealand? No, 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 not not New Zealand, right? No, 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 no. no. Sorry, wrong. Yeah. Sorry, wrong. Uh, wrong. Uh, wrong crowd. <laughs> yeah. So you were saying before, Lizzie, how that you you've got an interesting, which I noticed from your um di online diaries. So. You know, like you, you keep the uh, keep a very um strict, good um eating regime and exercise regime on tour, but I'm just like, what is your food kryptonite? Like, what is that one food that you just like? Oh, I've got to have that. Ooh, I wonder if I can guess it. <laughs> what is it? Um, hmm. uh, crunchy. Uh, what is it? The the hot, spicy, crunchy Cheetos. Oh, oh I can finish Cheetos? a whole bag of those. Mm -hmm. Wow! See, I didn't even know that. <laughs> that's that's a new one. It, it evolves over the years. I, I I too am a big fan of anything flaming hot. <laughs> oh, very nice, very nice. Oh, awesome. Well, I mean, I suppose we've got to get down to my two favorite questions. So, first of all, not me. So, first of all, uh, I reckon it's time we get exclusive, guys. Just me and you. Oh, and I suppose the viewers as well, but yeah, whatever. So, what would you say an exclusive fun fact is about each of you? Like something that you wouldn't normally tell a journalist. Could be absolutely. Sure. Huh. Fun fact. Um, that, I mean, some of so much of our lives are already out there. Like, what, I know. I'm trying to think of something. What do they not know for? about me? <laughs> yes, people end up normally so uh let's see um i'd say that lizzie is a very fun and loving very very loving drunk when when she's when she's got two or three glasses of wine in her she just wants to hug she just wants to hug you just tell you how much she loves you so but uh, that's pretty obvious it tracks with her character i think <laughs> tell it all my secrets um RJ, speaking of, of drinking, speaking of drinking, um, one of RJ's nicknames on tour is Shot Commander. Oh, yeah. because because whether and and this is this is the, he abuses his power as as uh, one of the bosses on tour because he'll gather all of our crew in before they have to load everything out into the truck and say it's shot time and just without them even asking if they want that want a shot <laughs> like nope. you have to like yep it, the, he'll just have them all lined up and everybody will feel 
obligated to take some. So there is there is that. <laughs> we, we, both, we both have some some uh, some party alter egos, I think. But that is the best way to keep yourself from getting crazy hammered every night. Because for me, I don't want to do a shot by myself. I, I'm I'm addicted to the social part of it. It's a social thing, you know. So if you're just hanging out and you just all do a shot, and then the secret is to drink water in between the shots, and that way you stay hydrated. So, uh, but a lot of our crew a, don't a follow. A rule that we never method. follow. That's my method. <laughs> <laughs> a, a rule that we have put in place that we hardly follow. That we hardly follow. <laughs> That's the trick, but not everybody follows it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so is it like tequila or Midori? What what recipe? Usually Jameson. Jameson. Oh. No. We say Jameson is the fuel <laughs> that jet propul jet the jet propulsion of Hailstorm is fueled by Jameson. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, I do Not like really. That. That's just funny. <laughs> I do love Jameson, so I'm, I'm with you there. So, okay, now time for my favorite question of all. That's right, people. It's what the fuck time. So you guys must have. So many priceless um, moments that make you just go, what the fuck just happened? Uh, so what is the most hilarious priceless what the fuck moment on your music career that you can think of? Hmm. First one that comes to head that just makes you go, whoa, what just happened there? It's a daily thing. I... Yeah, I was going to say, like, we, I think we have that all the time. Um, Take your pick. You think of any? <laughs> I am. I'm... I'm, I'm... Let's see. Fuck just happened. Um, there was a deck, weird. Sure. There was a weird moment. This is before we had our first. Is, is that the one I want to tell? Maybe. Um, there's a weird moment that happened to me. I, I guess all of us. I think RJ, you were there. I can't remember. Um, but this is when we were making our first album, and uh, we were all at a record store, Amoeba Music. And just looking at records and in walks Alice Cooper. And at the time I had never met Alice Cooper before. So I was like starstruck and I wasn't going to go up and say hi. And he was with his daughter who I vaguely remembered meeting in a bathroom in Philadelphia way back in the day before we were signed. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up saying hi to me first. And then before hello, Alice Cooper kind of looks at my key change, I, key chain. I had like a carabiner on with like a bunch of stuff that I needed. And I had a little uh, holder that held my earplugs. And Alice is like, hey, you don't by any chance have any Pepsid AC in there. I have a little bit of heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, those are earplugs. But my mom is with us and I'm sure she has some Pepsid AC. So I, I found my mom, our mom, and I was like, do you have any Pepsi AC in your purse? She's like, I think so. I'm like, I need it for Alice Cooper. <laughs> so I gave so I gave a bottle of Pepsi AC to Alice Cooper in a record store. And that was like the first time meeting the guy. And I remember being like, well, that was so incredibly strange. This was not like a meet and greet or a concert or anything. It was just in a record store. And all he wanted was Pepsi AC. <laughs> that's, that's his new drug of choice. It's the drug of choice. So, so, so therefore, you know, for a long time after that, I was like, well, I gave Alice Cooper drugs. So <laughs> <laughs> they, they aren't the illegal kind, but <laughs> they're for just antacids. Oh, wow. Wow. So, okay. What? It has been an absolute honor talking to you too. Like, it, great, great talking to you too, darling. You too, man. Yeah. 